right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for uh, having me here today. Uh, I'm a professor over at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and in my research lab, we use uh, the fruit fly, these little insects here. Uh, the same sort of insect you probably had uh, brought home from the grocery store at some point or found them buzzing around your house this summer. And these things are actually pretty complex little critters that have an interesting brain. So this is an example of a, a dissected fruit fly brain that's sort of stained with various dyes to light up the different cells of the brain. And so these little complex critters can be used to study traumatic brain injury. And so let's just jump right into talking about what traumatic brain injury is. And so it's really a disruption to normal functions of the brain due to some sort of physical injury. And so there are a number of different symptoms that can develop depending upon what area of the brain is injured or how severe the injury is. And so some of the things that uh, usually come to mind are things like uh, some confusion or maybe people being, say, knocked out or briefly incapacitated for a little bit of time. But there are other things as well, like seizures can be a complication resulting from traumatic brain injury. And then long term, we know there's risks for breakdown of brain tissue, which we call nerve degeneration. And so, well, is this really an issue? And so in order to look at that, let's think about how many traumatic brain injuries there are annually in the United States. And so this is just based on data from healthcare providers, so injuries that were severe enough to require some sort of medical treatment. And there's something like 1.3 million emergency department visits and about 52,000 deaths a year annually based on some data going between 2002 and 2006. And so that estimate uh, led to something like 1.7 million annual traumatic brain injury events in the United States. Uh, as we'll see, this is probably a large undercount, uh, but this would be a good number to start with. And so it's a fairly significant issue in the US. All right, now of those injuries, uh, most of them actually happen due to something as simple as a fall. And so we know this in Wisconsin, right, with our uh, icy winters and the hazards that poses, that's actually the largest category. Other categories include things like motor vehicle accidents, um, but I'll point out that this does not include military data, which can include other types of traumatic brain injuries like blast injuries. Um, but for the civilian population, falls are actually the, the most common source of these traumatic brain injuries. And so in order to talk about fruit flies as a model for traumatic brain injury, uh, we first want to appreciate that flies uh, actually have the same sort of outcomes to TBI as do humans. And so what's being shown here on the top, this is a brain slide tissue from a healthy individual post-mortem. So after their death. And on the bottom, this brain slice was taken from a boxer suffering from chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And so you can see all this brown tissue here that's sort of deteriorating, and it's uh, much smaller than the brain slice up here. And so this breakdown of neuronal tissue is a result of all those repetitive injuries suffered over their boxing career. Now if we pull up the fly brain, and so carefully dissect out these tiny little brains and put them under a, a certain kind of microscope, and you zoom in closely on them, You'll notice on the left side, this is our normal fly brain, and the right side, our fly brain after traumatic brain injury. And if you zoom in closely on this part of the brain here, you'll notice that there are actually these, what they're calling vacuoles, or holes in the brain that aren't present in healthy tissue. And so, as you would probably imagine, having holes in the brain is not a good thing. And so, this is sort of the same sort of fly uh, model for what's going on over here. With head injury, these animals are having breakdown of brain tissue. Okay, there are a number of other things that I won't show you the, the data for, uh, but these outcomes happen in flies, they also happen in humans. So I showed you some neurodegeneration. Flies are also briefly incapacitated or paralyzed following the injury. They'll often suffer seizures, have a loss of coordination. Uh, in fact, we know that they have shortened lifespan. Uh, there's disruption to the blood-brain barrier, the thing that separates the brain tissue and its fluid from your bloodstream. And so if the blood-brain barrier breaks down, it means that now pathogens or toxins can get from your body and your bloodstream into the brain tissue, which wouldn't be a good thing. And then there are also some cellular things like inflammatory signaling and activation of other pathways. And so flies show all these things, um, as do humans, in fact. So this fly model that we use in my lab is a very basic model. I know our theme here is the C model, so I'll show you a little bit of science and math today, but it doesn't get very technologically challenging in my lab. We did do a tiny little bit of engineering. I think you'll laugh when we get to that spot. But this is the fruit fly model, fruit fly model my lab uses, and it's developed by two researchers at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And so uh, Barry Ganetsky and David Wasserman developed this simple model. And so if you take fruit flies, these little tiny critters, and put them into a plastic clear tube like this, you push down a stopper and trap them in the bottom, put that onto the end of a spring, pull the spring back to 90 degrees, and then just let it rip. And that thing smacks down onto the counter. The flies hit the vial container, and they hit, hit their heads, they hit each other, and they suffer injury. And so here's immediately after injury, 
these flies, many of them are incapacitated. They typically wake up within a minute, and then we assess them for some sort of outcome, like neurodegeneration, lifespan, seizures, those sorts of things. Okay, so the primary outcome that's been reported in flies, because it's one of the simplest to do, is just check 24 hours after injury how many flies have died, right? So uh, we see that if you don't injure the fly, so zero injuries, there's zero death. If you injure them once after deflecting that vial to 90 degrees, this is some data from my lab, we end up getting about 10% death. And then as you do three and four hits, two, three, and four hits, you increase the death even more. Each of those little asterisk symbols here is to show you that when we tested this using some math and statistics, we know that these are in fact different outcomes. That the amount, that the amount of death you see here is different than here, and so on. So they're all different from each other. Okay, so we could model the sort of uh, main outcome that's already been shown, but we really wanted to do something uh, more, uh, inter what we thought was more interesting, and something that's very difficult to study, um, which is looking at mild and moderate injuries. And so I showed you this figure before, about 1.7 million injuries. And what we need to know is that 70 to 90%, so the huge majority of traumatic brain injury events in humans, are actually mild. But even more than that, uh, half or more of all TBI events uh, go unreported. And so these are just the ones that led to some sort of medical care. We know, for example, that individuals who suffer, say, mild concussions while playing sports, they don't always seek medical care, and so they don't make it into these statistics. And so the true number of traumatic brain injury events, when we include even these mild injuries, is probably something over three and a half million within the US. And so there are a lot of these injuries happening. But they're challenging to study because they're uh, challenging to model. Uh, it's hard to use humans for any of these sorts of studies. And in animal models, giving mild injuries only leads to sort of mild outcomes. And so it's challenging to see those sorts of things. Now, to give you an idea that these mild injuries are actually of significance, uh, I'm showing you some data here from a paper in 2013. But they're looking at this protein that's found primarily in the brain called S100B. And if you have breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, you start to see it into the, in the bloodstream when you take a blood draw. And so they looked at some players during uh, football games. And so they looked at players who played less than five minutes. And the amount of S100B in the bloodstream after the game compared to before the game was really not different. It was about zero, so about at this line here. Players who played but suffered no head hits had a little bit more, at least it looks like it, but it wasn't high enough to say that those things were truly different. However, players who played and suffered head hits, as determined by people who were just watching on the sidelines or watched video replays, um, had way more S100B, showing us that we're likely getting some breakdown of that blood-brain barrier. And what's, I think, interesting here is that none of these players in the game were pulled from play, none of them were given any treatment because none of them were deemed to have suffered a concussion. And so these are really sub-concussive head hits it's leading to a substantial change in this protein, likely caused by blood-brain barrier breakdown. And so we really think it's important to model or look at these mild and moderate repetitive TBI events to understand what's going on here, because once we know what's happening, then we can start looking at how we can intervene to make the outcomes less severe. Okay, so here's my really technical, really technological and engineering feat of the day. We took the standard TBI device, added particle board, hardware, and my cordless drill from home, which I then forgot it in the lab. And my wife asked me to hang a picture, and I said, I don't have a drill. Let me go back to lab. And she said, why is it in lab? And I said, a construction project. And so we built this. We built this really fancy device where it's the same sort of thing, except I have these little arms that can swing out. So we can stop it at either 60 degrees, 70, 80, or 90. And so here I'm stopping it at 60 degrees, so we get a milder injury, so it's a milder deflection. Okay, so are these different injury severities? Well, they sure are. Here we're looking at zero to 90 degrees for our deflection of the spring. And in fact, we get different outcomes depending upon which level we have. So we have four distinct levels of injury severity now. Okay, so what happens when we do these repetitive injuries at these different severities? Well, I'm gonna give you an analogy here using the sort of carnival ring toss game. So let's pretend you're playing carnival ring toss, and I give you four plays. Each play, you get a whole batch of rings and throw at the thing. And so let's look at if you play it one time. I give you a batch of rings, and you get five rings. You're feeling pretty good. And so that means five rings per play. If I give you two sets of rings to play with, and you get 10 total rings, again, it looks like you're getting five per play. We can go out to 15 and 20 for three and four plays. All this looks like every time you play, for every batch of rings you throw, you get five successes, right? And so this just looks like it's sort of randomness, that every time you play, you're just going to randomly get five successes. But if we had you play a second time, and you got five the first time, 
The second time, when you get two batches of rings, you got 12, three, you get three plays, you get 21, four plays, 32. Now we're seeing this increasing pattern. What looks like it's not just random chance anymore. This looks like something else is happening there. Something else is kicking in. If you have the plays, the 5% chance to start with, then it looks like you're probably learning here and getting better over time. And so this is a different type of relationship. And so to throw some technical terms at you here, this is what we call an additive relationship. For each play, you get 5% successes. And if you add more plays, you get that predictable number of increased successes. Here, this is a synergistic relationship, where every time you play, you get five, but because you're getting better each time, the number keeps going up. So five, six, to seven, eight. So let's look at uh, doing repetitive injury in flies rather than repetitive plays in the ring toss game. And so here's the data at 90 degrees. We have one, two, three, and four hits across the bottom. We're taking the total death divided by the injury. And so it's like we're plotting these numbers here, the death per injury, or your rings, your successes per play across your numbers of play. We can see here that we sort of get a flat line. We're not seeing that sort of stepping pattern. And so this looks simply added, that you're going to kill about 10% of flies every time you injure them using these severe 90 degree deflections. All right. But what's interesting here is that if you make the injuries less severe, if you back it off to even just 80 degrees, now you start to see this sort of stepwise progression. And if we actually plot a line across that, we find that we do get a synergistic effect. So you're getting something else happening. You have the actual outcome of a single injury, but then when you do two injuries, or three or four, something else is happening in between those injuries to make the outcome more severe. And so there are a number of things we think are happening here as we've begun to try to test those things to figure out what exactly is kicking in there to cause more severe outcomes when you have repetitive injuries. Okay. I'll point out this also happens at 70 degrees. In fact, we also know that if you expand the number of hits out far enough, we also see it at 60 degrees. And so you start to see these things when injuries are mild or moderate. Okay, so back to this idea then about humans and the fact that humans suffer millions of traumatic brain injury events a year, and most of those are actually quite mild. Uh, so for example, I mentioned some football play. Uh, there's a study that had individuals have sen wear sensors in their helmets and tracked how many injuries or how many head hits they suffered over the course of a season in college football players and found that it wasn't unusual for some of these players to suffer more than a thousand over the course of a single season. Um, and so that's only when they uh, include injuries that exceeded a certain threshold that were severe enough to be picked up by that sensor. And so if you count even less severe injuries, it's more than a thousand. So lots and lots of injuries here. And so we think that because you get this synergistic relationship, every time they suffer another injury, it's likely they're gonna get a more severe consequence because they're adding up and also something else is happening. Okay, so how can we use flies? Flies, I mentioned, are a nice tool. Uh, they're a good model here for traumatic brain injury, but we think we can use some of those special traits about the fly model to really tease apart what's happening and then step in and try to figure out if we can make things better in these animals. So the biggest advantage of flies, aside from the fact that they're small, and they reproduce within 10 days, they're real fast. You made two flies, 10 days later, you're overrun with more flies. And this is why you gotta get a hold of them at home right away on those bananas. Okay, so they also though have really simple genetics. So on their chromosomes, they have genes just like you and I. If we look at humans, humans have, for example, this gene that plays a role in neurons called a voltage-gated sodium channel, and they actually have nine different versions of that, all these nine here. And in the brain, they actually have at least three of them that are active. And so this makes it challenging to study, because if you get rid of one of those channels, the other one might sort of take its place and take its role. And so it's challenging to understand what's going on in humans, because the genetics are so much more complicated. Flies, though, flies are really nice, because, for example, for the sodium channel, flies have one, and just that one single gene. So if you make a change in that gene, you can be pretty sure you're going to get some sort of effect or some sort of result. We also, though, have tools in order to turn that gene on or off. Now, one of the other cool tools in flies I want to tell you about are these flies that we can make pass out at high temperature. It's sort of a cool party trick. You take a batch of these uh, flies in their vial, you stick it in warm water, and within like 45 seconds, they're all passed out, and they lay there. And they lay there for about 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes to half an hour. And so here's what happens. This is high temperature, 38 degrees. They're all standing at the start, and they all pass out in 30 seconds. And then it takes at least 10 minutes before they start waking up again. And actually, what we know is because based on what this uh, gene does, is that these neurons in the fly's brain are unable to release any more signaling substance, any more neurotransmitter. And so they're effectively paralyzed, and nerves are paralyzed for as long as they're passed out, which gives us time then, a 10 minute window, 
we can go in and do repetitive injury to figure out is that activity and is that signaling in the brain important to that synergistic effect, the fact that we're seeing those repetitive injuries build up more and more and more as we give additional injuries. And so another one of the cool tricks in flies. Uh, the last one I want to tell you about here, uh, which will lead into the, the next talk by Dr. Hireman a little bit, is about some genetic engineering in flies. So if you take a male fly that has a special sort of gene inserted in it, where there's a sort of nerve signal that turns on an activator, we get some activator protein made. If you then cross that fly or mate it with a female fly that has whatever your favorite gene is, these two things then are together in that offspring, the activator will turn on the favorite gene, and now you have your favorite gene turned on in nerve cells. And so there are a whole number of these things. Your favorite gene, uh, there's basically a version of this system available for every gene within the fly genome. And so we can go in and we can turn genes on or off as we want, and then we can ask, if we turn that on or off, does that make fly outcomes better or worse? Okay, can we play a video? Give a, who's the screen? Can you click in the middle of the screen? Oh, no, okay. All right, so um, we will come back to that maybe later if you'd like. Uh, my lab's been looking a little bit at seizures in fruit flies. Um, and so maybe we can, uh, if anyone has questions about that, I can tell you about some of our findings. I should give some credit though here, of course, the people in my fly lab that made this possible. And so these four individuals here were all undergraduates in my lab at the time, and I collected the data that I showed you that came from my lab, and that led to a published paper. Lauren and Ashley have since graduated, uh, but uh, Brooke and Nathaniel are still at GDB. Uh, current students, I've got a couple in my lab that are working hard right now using those temperature sensitive flies and so we're delving into those experiments. And then I also have to thank some people at UWGB for funding of course. And I think I'm out of time. Here. You're right on. All right. Give it up. Anybody in the room? Woo! Thank you so much. That was totally fascinating. I think the, we've got some questions coming in. Well, I mean just kind of a comment seeing what you have to do to like do repetitive brain and like really mild repetitive I imagined my children also loving that and so like <laughs> if, if you were looking for any more like hands-on desk yeah. yeah I mean I can source three for you All right. yeah I don't know what that says about us as parents but they might enjoy that but um okay so first question and maybe you know what this acronym is is TAO seen in the dissected fly brain also? TAO. I'm not sure. Tau. Oh, there we go. Tau. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so tau is a transport protein. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> tau is a transport protein that moves things along within nerve cells. And so yeah, flies definitely have their own version of the, the tau gene and tau protein. It plays a very similar role in flies as it does in humans. I don't know that anyone's looked at whether adding tau or take away tau makes TBA outcomes better, uh, but flies definitely do have that gene. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, further. Does this study provide an outlook on brain recovery? Can the brain recover? Um, and how long does it take if you've looked at it? Yeah, that's a good question. And so that's one of the things we'd like to now use this model. Now that we see these different outcomes at these different injury severities, one of our interests is in going in and figuring out what we can do in between the injury and whatever outcome we're looking at. Uh, for example, can we feed flies things like uh, anti-inflammatory drugs or uh, cool down the flies? There's some, some evidence actually by just cooling flies and make them colder, um, you actually make outcomes less severe. And so even just simple things like that, as well as some more targeted things using our genetic approaches. And so we haven't really gotten into any of that yet, but that's certainly it's a, it's a wide open field. That's the next phase. Yes. That, yeah. yeah. It's why you're doing all of this groundwork to kind of yes, understand. Yes, so develop the model and then go in and, and play with it and see what we can do to make things better. Yes. Um, does gender play a role in differing outcomes? Does gender play a role in uh, humans? It seems to uh, probably due to some of the sex hormones. Uh, I believe estrogen uh, has some uh, protective effects. Are thought to. Uh, in flies, uh, there doesn't seem to be any difference between male and female flies, and so we just throw them all in the same tube and just let it rip. <laughs> Makes it easier that way. Is that a technical term? Yeah, just let it rip. <laughs> and sometimes the students are a little bit uh, tentative about pulling that thing back far enough, and you gotta yell at my lab, no, pull it back, let yeah. it rip. Yeah. <laughs>